Hi, I'm Daniel Zengel with PRP Labs, joined by Don Lipscomb, and we're going to be discussing a study that used PRP to help patients with jumper's knee, also known as patellar tendinopathy. Uh, so Don, can you tell us a bit about this study? Sure, so this was a case series, and so I wanted to evaluate the clinical and radiological outcomes of three consecutive ultrasound-guided PRP treatment mm -hmm. uh, injections for treating chronic um, PT. Patellar tendinopathy. Yeah. Um, so they wanted to see if this would be a good alternative um, for basically having surgery. Right. Because apparently this hadn't, um, all the other non-surgical treatments had not worked on these patients mm -hmm. and they were all athletes. Right. And I think there were a few actually non-athletes, but they were still physically active people. Sure, right. Um, so there were 28 patients with chronic patellar tendinopathy. And uh, like I said, they hadn't responded to any of these other treatments. Um, so they came in for these injections. Um, there wasn't a control because this was just a case series. Right. So they were just- It's uh, just a clinic seeing these patients yeah. as they come in. And then they're documenting it and right. reporting it. However, um, they did mention that the same doctor performed all the injections. That's great. So then that minimizes variation that you would get just from, I guess, like the doctor's perspective of like where the injection should occur Absolutely. and things like that. And yeah. here's like understanding ultrasound, gra like that graphs too. and everything. Yeah, so. yeah. There's something to be said about the skill of an injection. Oh and yeah, the definitely. Ability. I'm glad they're using guided ultrasound. Mm -hmm. A lot of practitioners don't, but there's plenty of evidence to show that it will improve outcomes in, in many uh, procedures. Yeah, so. that seems like it would require a lot of precision. Actually, yeah, an yeah. Injection. When you're yeah. Doing a, an injection trying to target uh, some kind of tear or uh, lesion or anything, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's not just like a guess and check. Yeah, you don't like. have a vision. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's good. And then as far as the PRP preparation, mm -hmm. the authors did a good job of reporting that. Uh, they use the Athrex APC uh, system, and they started with 15 milliliters of blood and brought it down to six milliliters uh, after they processed it through the Athrex kit. Now, it's worth noting that the authors sort of... Uh, claim that this PRP will have a, more than twice the concentration mm -hmm. of platelets in the patient's blood. Um, however, we have looked at a study before uh, that was independent research done by Bioscience Research Associates where they actually measured the, the platelet recovery rates of various commercial PRP kits. And they found the Athrex kit had about a 49% platelet recovery rate. So if we apply the findings from this independent research, mm -hmm. Uh, going from a 15 milliliter blood draw, processing it through the Athrex kit, ending up with six milliliters, if there is only a 49% platelet recovery rate, that is not going to more than double the platelets. It'll actually only get you about 1.23%, uh, I'm sorry, 1.23 times yes, yeah. the platelet concentration that you'd find in baseline blood levels. Mm -hmm. So not a lot more, uh, but you're probably getting some of the red blood cells out of there. It is technically more concentrated. And um, it also should be mentioned, too, that the um, authors said that they took great care to make sure that there wouldn't be leukocytes okay. in this. So that'll come up a little later when we start talking about the biology. But it seems, sure. it seems like that's pretty important in terms of tendons and, and um, for uh, joint cavities as well. Right. And, and so they're doing an injection for four weeks every week? Um, uh, I think it's uh, once a week for okay. three weeks. For three weeks. That's yes. what it was. Uh -huh. And then they're following up. For, for up various, to two years. Oh, and it should also be mentioned, they prohibited the use of NSAIDs, yes. which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and it was noted in another video that you guys should check out. Um, so it prevents uh, platelet degranulation, so right. you're not going to get any of those growth factors Absolutely. that are so essential yeah. to actually make the treatment work. Yeah, so this is something that, that we talked about in another video, mm -hmm. that these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs prevent platelet degranulation, and effectively uh, Im impede PRP mm -hmm. therapy from working as much as it could. And so it's, in, in a study, if we don't see uh, the authors mention that the platelets shouldn't have yeah. been taking NSAIDs, that in and of itself is enough to throw off an entire study. So it's good that more researchers are aware of this, mm -hmm. including this in the study, and hopefully more and more providers are becoming aware of this so they can start seeing better outcomes. Exactly. Um, so at they, they mentioned that at three months, 57% of the patients, as determined by MRI imaging, mm 
um, were shown to have return of the patellar tendon, the structural integrity, and the functioning. Mm -hmm. And the other 43% actually showed partial healing. So okay. that means 57% of patients were ready go going back to their normal athletic activities. Right. And then I think at two years, um, that was their final follow-up, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. And, years and everyone a, and had everyone shown some it. improvement, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, um, well, none of the patients dropped out, which yeah. is kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, everyone had, had shown, uh, well, well, it was statistically significant yeah. improvement. I think there were actually a handful of cases that they deemed unsuccessful. Yeah, but, but I think that they said that their unsuccessful ones, though, were like just less than 75% Improvement, yeah. right. Which, I mean, that, that's pretty good standards. Yeah, It'd absolutely. Be too. Yeah, so they're, they're measuring uh, their pain scores, they're measuring uh, functional mm -hmm. uh, movement scores, and, and then I believe one of the other parameters they're looking at to determine had this athlete recovered was actually the exactly. hours uh, per week that they're exercising. So it's like how much they used to be able to do it before the injury versus now. Mm -hmm. And a vast majority of the patients were able to return to those pre-injury levels of exercise. And, you know, from a biological standpoint, this makes sense. What you're trying to do is uh, do a, have a long-term sustained result, right? right? Right, And so, like, a lot of numerous studies have shown that the growth factors in, um, that are in the alpha granules of platelets mm -hmm. actually contribute to this, right? Right. So there's, uh, they stimulate uh, tendons to regrow their collagen. Right. And they also promote uh, angiogenesis, right. new blood vessels. Absolutely. And um, so I guess one other thing that, that people who are looking into um, uh, treating tendinopathies and osteoarthritis for is to uh, be aware of what the, the concentration of leukocytes that right. might be in your product. Like if, right. you're, if you're sucking up a lot of the Buffy coat, mm -hmm. then you're probably going to be getting a lot of leukocytes, right? And, and so we know they use leukocyte poor PRP in mm -hmm. the study. That's what they report. And, and so. right, yeah. So that's yeah. what they tell us. So why, do you have any hypothesis as to why that would be relevant for patellar tendinopathy? Yeah, so um, it's thought that actually uh, leu the leukocyte concentration is directly correlated with catabolic gene expression in okay. tendons and ligaments. And so, when something um, uh, cat catabolizes, basically it eat, it kind of eats itself up. Sure. So this would actually have a detrimental effect. So it would it might it might like end up it might end up not making it worse, mm -hmm. but you won't have you won't actually have um, the big improvements that you would see without the leukocytes. Okay. Do you understand what I so, mean? So, so maybe the, the growth factors could could like counteract some of that. I see However, saying. if there's a big boost in catabolic gene expression, then you're going to lose a lot of those benefits depending right. on the concentration right. of leukocytes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So mm -hmm. Leukocytes are associated with this uh, inflammatory response, yes. clearing out the old clearing tissue. Clearing out the debris, yeah. Um, but in a joint capsule, you might not necessarily want a lot of that. Exactly, that because that's also a very, especially in a joint cavity, like, like the knee would okay. be, you're going to, um, there's not going to be a lot of exchange of fluid there okay. so you know you don't want to put a lot more inflammation into something that's enclosed right right you know? exactly so. okay well thank you don it sounds like prp might be a great option for athletes with patellar tendinopathy mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully we'll have some volleyball players out there um, <laughs> yeah thank you for coming out today and, and showing yeah, us a study you. i think that's it for today uh, we will be back next week with some more videos about prp so mm -hmm. see y'all soon